You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie, here in my little haunted house between Boston and Salem, Massachusetts. And I'm Johanna, talking to you from a very rural place outside of Vienna. And you're listening to your favorite international podcast. The podcast hosted by two friends who never met in real life and who present to you the most random and eclectic selection of all things dark and fascinating. That's right. And as always, we want to say thank you for all of your support, your messages, ratings, and reviews. Thank Mm -hmm. you so much for sharing our content with your friends. We, we really appreciate it. And of course, a special shout out to all of our patrons who keep the lights on and everything. Also, we have very exciting news. (laughs) I know you're all going to be thrilled when I tell you that award season is coming. It's Mm -hmm. coming in July, and starting in July, you're going to be able to nominate us for awards again. We'll get into that more. People's Choice Podcast Awards. The People's Choice, yes, that we've been so fortunate to win two years in a row, Best Female Hosted and Best History. So Mm -hmm. be prepared. It's coming. Be prepared. We thought maybe we were done. We thought, you know... Let's not. And then I woke up one morning and Johan had sent me a message at like 2 a.m. saying, I registered us for all the awards. And I was like, okay. (laughs) It's good. It's fine. Hey, listen, it's good to have something to aim for, right? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. All right. I think now it's time to jump directly into today's episode. Mm -hmm. So in in last week's episode, we talked about the very creepy encounter of Robert Taylor in the Detchmont Woods, Deckmont Woods of Scotland outside Edinburgh. I hope you've all gone and watched those videos. If you if you haven't, I really encourage you because fascinating case. Today's episode is more disturbing than last week's, substantially more disturbing. Last week was almost a little bit of a creepy palate cleanser because yeah. today's episode like a few weeks ago, we talked about the uh, terrible, terrible fairy tales, you know, that many European parents and grandparents used to read to their kids and grandkids. But sometimes that horror is not in fairy tale books. Sometimes it's actually happening in families, and sometimes it's brought upon you by members of your own family. Mm. And that is the case in today's episode when we talk about the life of Oceana Sneed. As always, we are using a ton of contemporary newspaper articles as sources, as well as the book Three Sisters in Black by Norman Searold, published in 1968. And once more, this is a two-part episode, once more we set out and thought, oh, this is a straightforward case, like you read uh, through uh, blog posts and, and what other people write about, and as it's short, and you think, oh, That's good. It's a straightforward case. Let's hope there is even enough there to fill an episode. Sometimes that happens. And then we started reading and researching and you find all these little rabbit holes. So yeah, two parts. Right. Also, quick content note, we will be mentioning suicide in this episode. All right. So this all takes place in the beginning of the 20th century, the so-called Edwardian era. And we talked about that time period a lot back in the episode about Evelyn Nesbitt and the murder of Stanford White, for example. And it takes place in New Jersey. Well, actually, it only ends in New Jersey, but to know the whole story, we need to go back in time and further down south to the roots of the Wardlow family. Actually, the roots trace back to Scotland, where the Wardlow clan seems to be one of the oldest names in Scotland, first being mentioned around 1220 with Henricus the Wardlow. The name Wardlow most likely comes from the ward, which can mean guard or uh, watch. And we talked about it last week, Annie. What is law? (laughs) Law is an old word meaning hill. Yeah, so watcher of the hill. That's a really good name. It is. In 1720, a man named Robert Wardlaw decided to leave the old continent and take his family to the new world. With him was also his 20-year-old son, William. 
At first the family settled in Pennsylvania, but soon they moved on to Virginia, and there, in the South, the family prospered, spread out, they became merchants, lawyers, uh, physicians, surgeons, bankers, and preachers. And their family slogan has been Familias Firmat Pietas, which translates to duty or religiosity, is that even a word? I don't know, mm -hmm. strengthens family. John Baptist Wardlow was born in Georgia in 1816 as one of 12 children, and he became a well-known Methodist reverend. In 1845, he married Martha Eliza or Elizabeth Goodall, and the couple had six children. Carolyn Bell, born 1845, Mary, born 1848, Virginia Oceana, born 1852, John, born 1854, Albert, 1856, and Bessie Gertrude, born in 1865. The youngest Bessie was born only a couple of months after the Civil War had ended, and John Baptist Wardlow struggled financially in those years after the war, but they managed to get back on their feet, more or less, and they did manage to give all of their children a good school education. Carolyn, Mary, and Virginia all became school teachers. In 1880, so when she was 35 years old, the oldest daughter Carolyn married a former Confederate soldier, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Maxwell Martin. This is really interesting for our history buffs out there. During the end phases of the Civil War, Robert Martin had been sent to Canada, where he was supposed to plan raids and terrorist attacks against the North from Canada. Okay, now he had eight men who called themselves the Confederate Army of Manhattan. And on 25th of November 1864, those eight men walked the streets of Manhattan and simultaneously started fires all over the island. They set fire to over a dozen different hotels, including the Fifth Ward Museum Hotel, Astor House, the Belmont Hotel, the Fifth Avenue Hotel, the Tammany Hotel, and the United States Hotel. And those were all kind of major hotels in New York City at the time. They also set fire to theaters and, that's what really fascinated me, the P.T. Barnum Museum. And it fascinates me because there are a handful of people who constantly show up in different episodes of ours. And P.T. Barnum, the greatest showman, is one of them. Mm -hmm. I don't remember when exactly, but I know that we've mentioned him at least twice or three times before, right? Yeah, he comes up a lot. This is from the Times Union from 26th of November 1864, which was a Saturday, and it was printed on page two. Uh, it's an excerpt from that article. Quote, The diabolical plot to lay New York in ashes last night proves that our apprehensions were well-founded and that the journals in New York and Brooklyn who, aff who affected to ridicule the matter were either very short-sighted or possessed a fellow feeling with the skulking conspirators. Last night, a deliberate, organized attempt was made to burn the commercial metropolis. The conspirators set on fire nearly at the same time the St. Nicholas, the St. James, the Metropolitan, the Tammany, the Lovejoy, the Brandreth and Lafarge hotels and also Barnum's Museum. It is worthy of notice that the New York Hotel, the headquarters of Copper Hedison and the favorite resort of Southern sympathizers was untouched. The incendiaries used Phosphorus in the infernal attempts. <laughs> yeah. That's bad though, right? Isn't phosphorus just crazy flammable? Mm -hmm. That just surprised me, sorry. <laughs> the uniformity that characterized the whole proceedings showed that the plan must have been organized long beforehand and every step premeditated. The mode of operating was the same in every hotel fired. The beds were saturated with phosphorus and, in addition to this, matches were found among the bed clothes and thrust into the ticks. I think the ticks is the, like, the stuffing in the mattress, maybe. Oh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. I think it's, like, mattress-related. Mm-hmm. I don't know, there's a word missing, and then rooms were taken by parties who were determined to fire the buildings and took this mode as the quickest way of doing it. The attempt at Barnum's Museum was peculiarly atrocious. The lecture room was crowded with men, women, and children when a bottle of the inflammable stuff was thrown upon the floor from the galleries which ignited the woodwork and the wildest scene of confusion followed. It was only by an extraordinary good fortune that many lives were not lost. At Niblo's Garden or Niblo's Garden, another terrible scene of a similar character was enacted. This next paragraph is great. Every man through whose veins courses warmer fluid than serpent venom must feel his blood boil while his heart sickens at this damnable attempt to destroy thousands of innocent lives and millions of property. 
What punishment can be too severe for such fiends? Hanging would be altogether too gentle and humane a way of ridding the world of the monsters. They should be treated to a dose of the same fiery element in which they sought last night to wrap the people of a sleeping city. After such diabolism as this on the part of rebels and rebel sympathizing conspirators, how much longer shall we continue to hear the sickening cant um, of their secession in our midst? Is it not infamous that their presses still teem with aid and comfort for rebels in arms and for rebels who skulk at night through our cities with the tools of incendiarism in their pockets? O oh, law-abiding, long-suffering, loyal men, how long shall your patience be abused? End quote. So the co-conspirators fled to Canada. I know that at least one of them, a man named Robert Cobb Kennedy, was caught and hanged. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Maxwell Martin, however, so the head of the operation or one of the heads, was put into jail, but he was pardoned by President Andrew Johnson in 1866 without ever standing trial. So Robert returns back home. He was from Kentucky and over the next years he works in the tobacco industry and in 1880, when he is 40 years old and Caroline is th uh, 35, the, the two get married. It's his second marriage. The couple moves to New York, and is it just me? I mean, it's kind of the audacity. The audacity. <laughs> At first, he plans to burn down the city, and then he moves exactly there. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to be a little bit not okay in the head if you were going to start those fires in the first place. I think we can just come from a place of assuming that this man is not okay, you know? In 1881, the first child is born, a boy named Hugh Hodge Martin. Unfortunately, he dies in 1888 when he's only seven years old. We will get back to him in a while. He died, I think, by falling downstairs. In 1885, on 20th of September, a second child is born, a girl, and they name her Oceana. We will soon see it's a family name on the Wardle family side, as one of Caroline's sisters, Virginia, has the middle name o Oceana. And also there are other relatives. And everyone called Oceana O.C. But apparently she wasn't too fond of that name. Oceana's father died on 9th, on 9th of January 1901. So when Oceana is only five years old and only three years after the death of her brother Hugh. There really is a lot of death and tragedy in this family. But let's move away from Caroline and her daughter, O.C., for a moment and see what her younger sisters, Virginia and Mary, have been up to during those years after the war. In 1874, Mary married a man named Fletcher Tillman Sneed, who had been a captain in the Confederate Army. Mary was 26 at the time and Fletcher, 46. The couple had three sons, Fletcher, who was born October 24th, 1875, John, who was born in April of 1879, and Albert, who was born on 4th of January, 1880. This is a lot of names and birth dates right now, but this is going to get kind of wild. So just stay with us and we'll keep reminding you of who's who and what's what. So Mary's husband and the father of her three sons, he dies on the 8th of May, 1891. They said he suffered from apoplexy, so I think we can assume that he had suffered from a stroke. All right, so now we have another widow and more fatherless children. What about Virginia, though? Virginia never married, and she never had any children. She had attended the prestigious and well-known Wellesley College here in Massachusetts, it is a women's-only private liberal arts college that was founded not long before, back in 1870. The census tells us that Virginia was living in Massachusetts in 1875. By the way, a famous woman who attended Wellesley around the same time was Katharina Lee Bates, an American poet who would write the words of the anthem, America the Beautiful. After college, Virginia started teaching at the Price School in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1892, she was asked to take over the presidency of the, we believe it's Sewell, S-O-U-L-E, female college in Murfreesboro, and this was an incredible honor. The history of the college had started in 1825, when Mrs. Mary and Nancy Banks opened the Female Academy, quote-unquote, that's what it was called at the time. They taught rhetoric, philosophy, belles lettres, which is like... Yeah, how to write beautifully. Uh, painting, needlework, and music. Okay, can I just say, 
that I would have loved that as an education. In 1852, the name was changed to Sewell College after Bishop Sewell of the Methodist Church. That's why no one knows how to pronounce it. Yeah. I thought it was a French spelling of soul or something initially. I I just wasn't sure. During the Civil War, it was closed and its buildings were used as hospitals for wounded soldiers. Some of the buildings were also damaged. However, the school was able to open back up in 1866. And so in 1892, Virginia took over the school. The following comes from the newspaper, The Tennessean, and this is from the 21st of May, 1892, which was a Saturday, and this is on page six. Educational Matters, quote, Consolidation of Murfreesboro Schools for Young Ladies. It has been understood for some time that negotiations were pending for a transfer of the property known as Soul College from the owner, Professor J.G. Patty, to Miss V.O. Wardlaw of Nashville. The trade has been affected, the formal transfer of the property with all its appointments to take place on the 10th day of June, when Miss Wardlaw will take the presidency. Miss Wardlaw has secured, as members of the faculty, Mrs. McFadden and Spear, who have, for a number of years, successfully conducted the Murfreesboro Seminary. The institutions have thus been consolidated and are working in perfect harmony. Professor J.C. Metcalf, one of the foremost educators of the land, who has been connected with the faculty of the college for two years, is to be retained as a member of the faculty. Miss Wardlaw, who for a number of years has been a prominent factor in the success of Price's College for Young Ladies, Nashville, proposes to make Sewell College a modern school for young ladies. The curriculum will be thorough and many new features and approved methods will be introduced to advance and elevate the previous high standard of the school. Miss Sneed, for a number of years a member of the faculty of Dr. Price's Nashville College for Young Ladies, has been secured by Miss Wardlaw and will introduce the gymnasium in Sewell College. This feature was made celebrated by Miss Sneed in Nashville. The stereoptician will also be one of the new features introduced by the new president of Sewell College, imparting instruction in the sphere and course of study under her charge. Particular attention will be paid to music and art. Sewell College, under the new faculty, will win deserved and unprecedented prosperity. End quote. What I find interesting that by taking over the presidency of the college, she also becomes the owner of the property. I mean, I'm sure she must have paid a, quite a sum of money, but I wonder how that worked back then. It is interesting. I guess, so any private school would be that way, in a way, though, even today, right? I mean, it would be, today it would be more like an entity purchasing it, right? Like, there's a school or a religious organization or like a Montessori yeah. group, whatever, that's going to buy buy the school. I think it's rare nowadays for a, for a single person to purchase a whole school and run it. Yeah, I, don't I know. agree. Maybe it's not. I have no idea. I'm not in that kind of circle of schools. Now I'm thinking of the X-Men. I'm like, I don't know if you had enough money, like Dr. Francis <laughs> Xavier had that yeah, whole school maybe. right out of his... <sighs> anyway. So... After Virginia had taken over her new position, she had her parents live with her in Murfreesboro for a while, and then they moved to their own little cottage in town, and on 9th of May 1896, John Baptist Wardlow died in Murfreesboro at the age of 80, and that same year, Mary and her three sons moved to Murfreesboro. Mary started to teach at the Sewell College just as Virginia was, and both sisters, who now constantly wore black were rather well liked, not only in school but all over town. They were smart, social and knew how to run the college. And everything was great. Until, as always in our episodes, until 1901. (laughs) That's when up north in New York, Robert Maxwell Martin had died and the oldest Wardlow daughter, Caroline, arrived in Murfreesboro. Her 16-year-old daughter, Oceana, in tow. Oceana was a very pretty, very friendly young girl. Everyone in town who met her just loved her. She enrolled at Sewell College and became one of the best students at the school. But pretty soon things started to go south. Caroline started to take over. She appeared to be the one who was in charge all of a sudden. Uh, She appeared cold, distant, rather harsh at times, but she never failed to mention all the important friends, quote-unquote, she had in New York. She was a total name dropper, like, oh, I know the Astors and the Vanderbilts and, uh, you know, these kind of things. 
And all of the school's finances now went through her, so she was in total control of the money as well. And that doesn't seem suspicious at all, right? I mean, that's totally normal. No, that's fine. What could possibly sure. go wrong? <laughs> Nothing is <sighs> fine. Well, you guessed it. The school started to miss payments. And then young Oceana fell sick and stopped attending classes. When asked about what's going on with Oceana, her mother and her aunt said that she has the measles. But when after more than a month Oceana was nowhere to be seen, people started to get suspicious. From spring all through summer, Oceana stayed in her room and people at school and in town grew more and more uneasy and they started to inquire. What they learned was that just shortly before Oceana had fallen ill, a life insurance had been taken out in the young girl's name. And I think we all heard enough similar stories and we know that's, that's not great. I mean, not the part about the life insurance, that's great, but the part where the person falls sick immediately afterwards? Immediately afterward, mm -hmm. right? Like, anytime something untoward befalls someone who has just had life insurance taken out on them by someone else, it's going to not look great. Yeah. Doesn't mean there's a problem, but it doesn't look great, does it? Yeah. I mean, coincidences exist, but... Yeah, sure. What I find remarkable is that the people grew so worried about the girl that they insisted that she could see a doctor. And so a doctor came, but he was not allowed to enter Oceana's room. She was brought out to him in the hallway on a cot. Again, rather suspicious, I'd say. And she looked very weak, very pale. The doctor checked her thoroughly and couldn't find anything seriously wrong with her. Of course, taking the standard and knowledge of medicine back in those days, that doesn't mean anything. There could have still be something wrong with her. Even though the beginning of the 20th century was actually groundbreaking when it came to medicine. Watch the nick, everyone, please. The doctor gave her some prescriptions and that was pretty much all he could do. At least from then on, Oceana was seen in school and in town, at least now and then. But she would often fall sick again and had to stay in a room for prolonged periods of time. But that wasn't all. The school really started to feel weird. Girls were moved from one room to another on almost daily basis. And the three sisters, always dressed in black, some of them even with whales most of the time. Caroline was also wearing very old-fashioned, at the time already old-fashioned, black fingerless gloves. They wandered the hallways and corridors. Some doors were locked with heavy padlocks and nobody was allowed to enter the, those rooms that were locked. And Caroline behaved creepiest of the three. She would often scare young students by staring down on them in the courtyard from one of the windows high above them. And she was all dressed in black and her face was harsh and without any emotion, the students said. It sounds seriously like some scary movie, but it's what happened, apparently. I... All right. Is it awful that I'm like, I don't know. I could see it sort of being like fun to dress, to dress up like... We would totally do that. I think but, like, so. But sarcastically like a, to scare yeah. them. <laughs> right, yeah. In a in a yeah. This is creepier because I don't think she's actually trying to be creepy. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I totally get it. She's naturally creepy. <laughs> like maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's Graveline. I don't even know. Like what creepaline side of yeah, creepily. <laughs> <laughs> it gets even creepier, according to the testimony of some of the students, one of the girls and it's really creepy. One of the girls so claimed bad. that one night she awoke in her room and saw the three sisters, all in black, standing in a half circle around the stove in her room and they were chanting and mumbling things. And I think the student probably was just lying there in horror, trying not to move, you know, acting as if she was still asleep because she only asked them about the incident the next day. And the sisters explained that they had smelled smoke coming from the room and wanted just to check that the stove was working properly. Mm. On another occasion, the same student, according to the book The Three Sisters in Black at least, was attending some late night classes and Virginia had invited her to sleep in her room so that the girl wouldn't have to walk to her own room at such a late hour. The student agreed but wouldn't be able to sleep one minute because the whole time Virginia had been sighing and crying in her sleep saying, my god, my god, my sister. And I imagine it's such an awkward incident. First of all, sharing a room with one of my teachers in high school. <laughs> no, thank you. No, no. And don't get me wrong. I had great teachers, but that's just too real life. You know, it's like teachers should just exist at school. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
And then not only sharing a room with a teacher, but hearing her have nightmares the whole night. That's it's an actual nightmare. None of that is okay. No, no. But there's more. There were townspeople who would recall often seeing the sisters board a horse-drawn carriage in the middle of the night that would take them to the local cemetery where they would wander between the gravestones and mumble in low voices for hours. I just want to say that all of these stories came out afterwards, after everything the sisters had done came out, and I can honestly imagine that some of those eyewitness reports, quote-unquote, were embellished quite a bit. Oh, definitely. You can tell the ones mm. that just seem a bit... But the thing is, the most horrific stuff is all true. Yeah. Like, none of this, you know, it's said that this happened and that happened. Mm. It's like, well, it might have, but that's not any of the really awful stuff, so... And you I mean, know? I do think that those three women dressed in black were a tad bit eccentric and acting mm -hmm. in an often very strange and bizarre way, even if they might not have wandered around the cemetery at night, right? Yes. All these bizarre activities led to students leaving the school and the unpaid bills led to the school's committee to finally say enough and they kicked the three sisters out of Seoul Female College. Unfortunately, it was too late. They tried for several years to restore the school to its former glory, but to no avail. Seoul had to close in 1917. The main building was sold to the town of Murfreesboro, and they tore everything down and opened a public school. And as far as I could figure out on Google Maps, that school also doesn't exist anymore. And there is the Murfreesboro Housing Authority in that location and also a non-profit organization called Read to Succeed. And they are offering literacy programs to children and adults, which is a great thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right. So now we have several dead people, some creepy and suspicious behavior by three women in mourning clothes, a young girl with the life insurance in her name being constantly sick and a whole school basically being run to the ground. It's a lot. After the sisters were kicked out of the school, they didn't leave Murfreesboro immediately. Oh no. They moved into two rooms in a house on North Maple Street, rented to them by yet another Confederate veteran. So it's the three sisters and Oceana living in those two rooms. The blinds are always closed. No one's ever allowed into the room. No one knew if they were even properly furnished. No one had any idea what was in those rooms. The sisters would only ever leave the house at night and always dressed in all black with those veils covering their faces. Oceana, of course, was never seen outside. During their time at this house on North Maple Street, two things happened. Number one, a former army buddy of Robert Maxwell Martin, a man named Captain Heedley and his wife came to town. And they had heard that Martin's widow and his lovely daughter, Oceana, were living in Murfreesboro. And of course, they wanted to pay them a visit. And so the couple makes their way to the house where the sisters and Oceana live. And Caroline comes downstairs to greet them and then settled with them on the porch to chat. She wouldn't invite them inside. Mrs. Heedley asked about Oceana and heard that the girl was too sick to see any visitors. Of course, the two visitors had heard a few of these, like, wild stories that were now being told about the sisters, and so they politely insisted that they really wanted to see Oceana. Virginia joined them on the porch, and she also tried to make it clear to Captain and Mrs. Heedley that Osi couldn't see anybody, but the two kept insisting, and so after some back and forth, they were indeed led upstairs to a barely furnished dark room where Oceana was in bed. The girl looked sick and weak, but told the visitors that she didn't feel sick at all, and that also she wasn't in any pain, but she felt very sleepy and tired and drowsy. And of course, this didn't really sit right with the Heedleys, and they thought this was all a little bit suspicious and sinister, but they didn't feel like there was really anything they could do. So they said goodbye to Oceana, and they left. The other thing that happened during that time at the house was that Fletcher Sneed, one of Mary's sons, came for a prolonged visit. So all three of Mary's sons, Fletcher, John, and Albert, had left town to do their own thing. Schools, and some of them worked in a sawmill. And I think they had already left Murfreesboro before, school kicked, before the school kicked the sisters out. But then Fletcher came back, and he entered the two rooms the family had rented. And he didn't come back out for three months. The townspeople said 
that, quote, when we first saw Fletcher enter the house, he was smooth-shaven. Three months later, when he left the place for the first time, he wore a full beard, end quote. They never saw him outside of the room in those three months, but the neighbors could hear the constant clicking of a typewriter. He was probably trying to start a podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, he probably had to write some thesis for uh, school. Also, the full beard doesn't sound too weird. I think that's something many students experience all over the world throughout history. Yeah, my husband used to emerge from winter with a full beard. So it's not, it's not terribly weird. Also, at this time, the three sisters started to deposit their belongings all over town. So this is... This is so bizarre. <laughs> this is a problem. This is this is a real problem. All right. So what they would do is they would go to different stores and they would say, hey, is it all right if we just leave some of these items or these documents or this furniture <laughs> with you for just a little while? Just random stores. Yeah. Random stores. Random. We're going to come back and pick it up later. We promise. <laughs> and I guess people were like, uh, sure. The problem was they didn't pick everything back up, but we'll get more into that later. Just sort of keep it in the back of your head that they were just leaving things all over town. The sisters, they really had some moxie when it came to asking people for favors, like storing things. One time Caroline went to a private residence and asked if she could store some of her belongings and furniture in one of their rooms. <laughs> <laughs> can you Can you imagine? I just... You know what, though? There's lots of people out here, out there, just, like, if I was on fire, I would struggle asking someone to help put me out. <laughs> like, <laughs> other people are like, can I just store my furniture in your house? But she must have been persuasive because the homeowners said yes. So she stored some things in one of the rooms, and then she came back another day asking if she could go through some of her documents. <laughs> Like she says, so one day this lady shows up at your house and she's like, can I leave this desk in your in this room of your house? And you just want her gone. So you're like, fine. And then she comes back and she's like, hi, I just need to go through some documents in that desk. And then she just fucking settles in at this table that she'd left and, and takes up residence at their house for days while she works through her papers. Can you imagine? I, I oh, she even invited friends over. <laughs> <laughs> and then just as quickly as she was there, she disappeared. She took all her shit and got out. What is happening? So the sisters in Oceana, they finally leave Murfreesboro in 1905. They had paid the rent for those two rooms, more or less, which meant they sometimes paid and sometimes not. They were rarely on time. And so they all simply up and left in the middle of the night, leaving a debt of unpaid rent of $75 in their wake. That's a lot of money. According to the inflation calculator, that would be the equivalent of $2,600 today. Mm -hmm. But where had they gone? Well, they split up. Mary went back to Oglethorpe, Georgia, where she'd lived with her late husband. Caroline and Oceana had gone back to New York, and Virginia went to Christiansburg, Virginia, where her 93-year-old maternal aunt, sister of her mother, Oceana Seaburn Pollock, was the director of Montgomery College. We told you before, it's a family name. I like it. I think it's a mm -hmm. really pretty name. It's really pretty. Yeah. 93-year-old Oceana. Oceana. I'm never sure if it's Oceana or Oceana. But Oceana was happy that her niece had shown up. She could finally retire and hand over the management of Montgomery College. The Montgomery Female College opened its doors in 1852 as a companion school to the Montgomery Male Academy. Aunt Oceana had purchased the struggling school in 1876 at a private auction and had made the college successful with the help of very talented educators. This successful phase didn't last long, though, and the school had to close in 1890, only to be reopened in 1903. Now it's 1905, and Aunt Oceana hands over the keys to the school. Fun fact! Christiansburg was founded in 1776. I mean, there have been settlements there for a longer time already, but I think that's when it became officially Christiansburg. In the beginning, Burg was still written with uh, H at the end, so B-U-R-G-H. Uh, it was a rather small town for a very long time. The census said that in 1850, there were 532 people living there. 1860, 739 people. 1870, 
864 people. And if we go to 1900, it's 659. So it went back down a little bit. And in 1910, 1560. So it's always uh, around 1000 inhabitants, right? Yeah. But even though it was so small, it has a very interesting history and no worries, I won't tell you about it. I just wanted to say that Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett and William Clark from the Lewis and Clark expedition, they all lived in Christiansburg for a while. And I find that very interesting. It is very interesting. A lot of places with little plaques on them in that town. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right, so Virginia is now the head of the Montgomery Female College, and also remember they had one other sister, the youngest one, born in 1865, Bessie. She and her husband live in Christianburg, and they can introduce Virginia to all the important people. We won't really talk about Bessie because she doesn't really have anything to do with things that happened in this case. But yeah, Virginia is running the school, and in the beginning, everything is great, no problems whatsoever. But then Mary arrived, and of course, Caroline and Oceana arrived in Christiansburg soon after. The three sisters were once more united, and of course, just as it happened in Murfreesboro, Caroline immediately took over. She changed the school schedules and curriculum, she took over all of the finances, and she once more locked some of the rooms with heavy padlocks. And again, the three sisters would wander around the hallways and corridors in their black dresses covered in black veils, just creeping everyone out. I love it. I kind of like, that's my dream job, but just, <laughs> just doing that. But what about Mary's three sons, though? What about Albert, John, and Fletcher? Well, Albert had gone to Colorado and he'd bought a ranch, and we can only say good for him because that probably saved his life or at least spared him a lot of trouble. John and Fletcher, however, were in Tennessee where they ran a sawmill. They also started courting two daughters of a prominent lawyer, and soon both brothers were married. Fletcher had married Vashti Gordon McLaurin in 1899. Their son Robert was born in 1900. And John married Annie Laird McLaurin in 1903, and their son John Jr. was born in 1904. Everyone's fine. It's all good. But that's going to change as soon as Caroline takes over Montgomery College, because one day, out of the blue, she shows up at the home of John and Annie, and she insists that he come with her to Christiansburg and start working as a teacher at Montgomery. Annie was absolutely against her husband going to Virginia, and this one time, John really did put his foot down, and he told his Aunt Caroline that he wouldn't come with her. When she wouldn't stop bothering him, he even called the police and had her removed from his home. But Caroline wasn't one to give up easily. I mean, I think we're understanding more and more now how she got people to let her leave things, like why people had her, her belongings in their homes and, and shops. It's like, fine, just go away. Just go, yeah. Just please go away. And so that's what's happening now. She's not going to give up. She shows up again only a few weeks later, and this time he caved and followed her to Christiansburg, leaving his wife Annie and their young son in Tennessee. So Annie sends him these tearful letters begging him to come back home, but he's not really in control of his own life anymore, and he did as his mother and aunts told him to. Annie, of course, is heartbroken, and some sources say her health started to deteriorate so much for a while that she had to stay in like a sanatorium for a while to recover from that. We're not 100% sure that's correct, but I wouldn't be surprised mm. because that's a pretty fucked situation. I honestly wish John would have stayed with his wife and son because what happened next is truly so sad. Well, it started off with a weird little accident John had when he was traveling with his aunt Caroline on a train. He fell off the train. And when I say accident, I put it in air quotes because while John and Caroline both insisted that it had been an accident, there were other people on that train who were sure they had witnessed a suicide attempt. Or was it an attempted murder? Did John fall, jump, or had he maybe been pushed? A while later, John almost drowned in a cistern. This time Virginia was nearby and she screamed for help and John could be pulled out of the water just in time. John and his aunt claimed that he had fallen into the cistern by accident while he was taking measurements, but outsiders believed that it was yet another attempted suicide. And then, 
early March, Virginia was once more crying for help for something that was going on in John's room. Two teachers rushed to the scene and saw John lying on the floor, engulfed in flames, and they hurried to extinguish the fire, but it was too late. John died from the severe burns. Virginia was adamant that this too had been an accident, that John had tried to light a fire in the stove, or that he had tried to light a lamp, and that his nightshirt had caught fire, but the witnesses were certain that they had seen nothing that had indicated that John was about to light a lamp or start the oven. But what they did is they smelled that his bed sheets, as well as his clothes, had been doused in kerosene. This is a little note from the Matthews Journal, Matthews, Virginia, on 8th of March, 1906, a Thursday, page 1. Quote, Professor Sneed burned to death. Washington. Special. At this patch from Christiansburg, Virginia says, Professor Sneed of the Montgomery Female Institute committed suicide by saturating his clothing and bed with oil and then setting himself afire. He returned from a sudden trip and after retiring to his room, his screams of agony awakened the faculty and pupils who rushed to the room to find him writhing in flames upon the floor. He lived only a few hours. His mind is supposed to have become deranged through brooding over the long incurable illness of his wife. End quote. And here again they mention his wife Annie being sick, long, incurable sickness. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you one thing though. Annie died in 1968 at the age of 94, so that's a long life. And according to the census, she stayed all her life in Linville, Tennessee, where she was born and where she had lived with John. She never remarried. She outlived her only son, who had died in 1922 at age 18 from some kidney problem. I would have loved to find her obituary to maybe see if she found at least some little bit of happiness after all that loss, and I truly honestly hope she did. Yeah. And we will talk more about the tragic death in this whole family next week. Yep. There's a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's so strange that the whole narrative of the sick wife, because... It doesn't make any sense that if his wife were that sick, he'd leave. Like, why would you leave her? You know, it's it, it, it all just... I mean, they say she got sick after he left, but if yeah. she was that sick, incurably sick, and then she dies at 94, I don't know. It doesn't really make sense, right? No, it doesn't. I mean, I can see it being mental health issues because of the whole situation. Yeah. Oh, I could see that too, if your husband abandons you. For sure. There's a lot to talk about. Next week. Do you have something good? Yes. Have I, did I mention my, did I mention my birthday present yet? No. Okay. I, I feel like I keep forgetting. I have a lot of something goods like stacked up now. Sometimes you get a few in a week and it's like, I better hang on to these because sometimes there's none and you and I are both like, anything good? No. How about you? No, everything's <laughs> terrible. So for my birthday, I had... A really, really nice gift from Paul and my sister and my dad, who got me a metal detector. And I'm so excited I finally have a metal detector. It's so cool. I know, but then Paul said I can't dig any holes in the grass in the backyard because it's taken him so long to get a lawn to grow. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to taking it to the beach. I am going to take it around in the backyard and dig holes. He'll forgive me. But I'm also going to take it to the beach, which I think will be really fun. Um, I'm just excited to have a metal detector, that's mm -hmm. all. It's nothing nothing super exciting. Oh, I think but... it's so cool. You can go with my nephew once you're here because he also has one. I love it. It's so fun. How about you? My something good is that yesterday I slipped and fell down the steps in our garden that leads like it's one, two, three, four, five, five steps. That is three and then like a little plateau and then two more steps and the last two steps I slipped and I fell, thinking I broke my ankle. Oh. I was lying there for a minute and Jem even came yeah. and he was rolling around in the grass next to me and, <laughs> you know, wanted some belly scratches. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so I was lying there and for a whole minute I was trying to check the whole situation. And my something good is that nothing is broken. <laughs> um, I just tore or twisted my ankle and it's already way better today. And uh, yeah, so yay, not, not broken <laughs> yay. ankle. That's really yay. good. It was bad. Great. It was like, it made this really noise. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. I do. <laughs> I do. I'm telling you, I think it's just the universe telling you, you need to put your feet up for a few days. Probably. You've been doing a lot lately. A lot. <sighs> you're, you're a busy bee. It's fine. 
It's fine. fine. Everything is fine. It's fine. <laughs> We're fine. It's funny. My friend, my friend Dawn is coming with us on this trip and she came to the house the other day because uh, we were going to, I had some things to return and we were out. I can't even remember. She's probably trying to help me find shoes, which is endlessly nightmarish. But I came out, I was finishing getting dressed when she arrived and I came out and uh, I was wearing my t-shirt that says, I'm fine. It's fine. Everything's <laughs> fine. And she just started laughing so hard because in her hands, she was holding a t-shirt she'd just gotten for me that said, it's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> She's like, I got you a, oh. <laughs> So now I have two of them and a sweatshirt. I have a sweatshirt that says that too. People, well, a lot of people have given me that. <laughs> triple fine. Everything is triple fine. Because it's, it's fine. Clearly, it's everything is fine. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, we would be ever so grateful if you would please write a review and leave a rating. And you can do that all over the place now, mm-hmm. like in Spotify. I think, can you even leave comments in Spotify? It's all these places now you can leave reviews. I have the feeling that in Spotify, you can even review or rate uh, episodes. Like You can, different by episodes, episode. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can ask questions and comments. I should try it. I, I've, I haven't tried it. I'm going to leave a comment in one of the Spotify things just to see mm-hmm. where it goes. Like, do we get it or does it, is it just, it's a great I question because I never use yet. Spotify. We should no, know this. No, I only had it the other day. I had it on for something in it. Um, Probably the Amazing Fresh Hell podcast playlist. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a playlist on Spotify that I created called the Fresh Hell mixtape, which <laughs> it's it's a lot. It's a lot. It's random music. and eclectic. <laughs> it's very eclectic. <laughs> yep. Very eclectic. So there's other mixes on there too. You can check out. There's like a driving one. There's a riding one. There's a breakup one. There's a grieving one. I like, listen, I used to be the mixtape queen. I don't think that ever leaves you. (laughs) You can take the mixtapes away from me, but I will not stop creating playlists. What else? Our website is freshhellpodcast.com. You can go there to find out how to listen to us, links to everything. Our email address, if you would like to send us a listener story or if you have any questions or any any anything at all, mm-hmm. you can email us, freshlpodcast at gmail.com. Our Patreon is amazing. Really looking forward. We're talking on the 5th, right? Yes, about Maura Murray, like a little chit. Mm-hmm. That is really going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to that. What else? Get ready for award season as we said maybe you listen to this episode when award season already started on 1st of july so then please go to podcastawards.com and vote for us in the usual categories best female hosted true crime and of course please history that would be great and i think that's it that's it tell your pets we said hi hug them cuddle them give them belly scratches even if you're lying in the grass with a broken ankle and an almost fractured hip The dogs come first, the pets come first. Um, Be kind to them. Be kind to other humans out there, if possible. And be kind to yourself, because that's the hardest part of it all. Uh, It really is. It's, It's the worst. And just remember, listen, if you're going through hell, keep going. It's going to get better. All right? Tschüss. Bye. See you next week. Bye.